Hi, my name is Luke. Well, actually, it isn't. But when time comes to exercise some demons and share a few episodes, anonymity is necessary. And speaking of time, I was almost 45 when I lost my job at the university. I was a teacher there for 20 years when they finally decided to let me go. This only contributed to the implosion of my marriage, which wasn't already experiencing a healthy and happy period. Me and my wife simply realized that we couldn't stand each other anymore, so I left our home. We have one daughter in her early 20s, but she's a complete disgrace. Her lifestyle is a complete mess. Half of the time, she doesn't even live in our house, at least when I was still around. She had some more boyfriends that I could remember, and given some medication that I saw, I'm pretty sure she has HIV or AIDS. Being a beautiful girl, it's always been easy for her to find someone to give her money. Apparently, it came with a price. In any case, I wasn't exactly sad when I left those two women behind me. My ex-wife and only daughter, who I barely knew and definitely had no intention of knowing any better. Still, I had to find a new place for me to live and also a new job. Fortunately, I had a generous amount of savings, which allowed me to rent a decent apartment. As for the job, well, I decided to try a new life as an Uber driver. And of course, I had the career and previous experience to find something with a better paycheck, but my mind was already drifting, and I was feeling restless and depressed. So, this felt like an adventure. Going to different places, meeting new people, even for a short and casual talk. Plus, I always loved to drive. The first couple of weeks were a little bit stressful, but at the same time, I was enjoying it. There was a feeling of adrenaline that I liked. I was already dealing with all sorts of clients, driving them to distinct destinations. Most of these individuals were relatively boring, others drunk, sketchy, or annoying, but a few of them also very interesting. I particularly enjoyed the beautiful women, of course, specifically when they were alone or at least with other female friends. Nevertheless, after a month of being an Uber driver, something happened, and it wasn't exactly glamorous. On one occasion, I drove a client to a bad neighborhood. A young man, probably no older than 20 years old, appeared to be nervous. He was shaking and sweating from head to toe. He had long blonde hair which covered his face. Hey, uh, buddy, are you all right? I asked more concerned about knowing if he had money to pay for the ride, and also by making conversation. I thought I could prevent him from throwing up in the car. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, it's good. I'm, uh, just a little sick. Don't worry, I can pay for this. It's all good. He replied, as if reading my thoughts. I assumed that he was just in need of his daily dose of some kind of drug. Eventually, I arrived to his destination, an old house on a dark street, the young man was faithful to his word and paid me. As I was driving back, I saw someone lying on the sidewalk in one of those creepy and a half-abandoned dark streets that were part of the neighborhood. It appeared to be a woman. Feeling in a good mood because I had received money from my client, I decided to check to see if the woman needed any help. I stopped and got out of my car and approached the woman, not even knowing whether she was dead or alive. Now... I think my subconscious just made a connection to my rebellious daughter. How she could, one day, sooner or later, be in the same situation. Um, hello? Do you need any help? It's dangerous to be here lying on the street like this, I said, getting closer. I couldn't see her move at all, so I touched her to see if she was actually breathing. Then, finally, I got a response. Hey! Get away from me, you creep. It's a free country. It was indeed a young woman, although she didn't look so young. Very thin, dark and dead eyes, just like her hair. My name is Luke. Let me help you. This is no life. How old are you? Let me call your family, I said, not really measuring my words, but I felt good saying them. I'm old enough to be your daughter, you sick dude. I'm off duty tonight. No party. Take your money and your sick fantasies somewhere else. I really want to help. Please, 
I can take you somewhere. Uh, a shelter. My name is Luke. What's your name? I have a daughter your age, I insisted. Yeah, I heard you the first time, Luke. I'm a junkie. I don't have a name, and I'm not deaf. Good for you and your daughter. Now, unless you want to help me by giving me some serious money, get lost, the woman replied. Suddenly, I felt an urge, like an epiphany. Thoughts were being whispered into my mind. She's lost. There's no way back for her. There's only one option, to end her pain, to put her out of her misery. The poor child. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? Why are you crying? You're insane, dude. Back off! The woman shouted as I, with tears of sadness in my eyes, grabbed her by the throat with one hand and the other covered the woman's mouth and nose. I saw her surprised eyes, confused as I suffocated her to death. It was quick, easy, and painless. I felt relieved, and I believed in her own way. She did too. I hid the body behind some bushes nearby. It was only for a couple hours. My shift was over and after returning to the Uber, I was going to get to my own car to pick up the girl's body. This was done in less than a couple hours while it was still dark, so no one saw us. And even if they did, who would care? No one would, except for me. I covered the girl with a big blanket and took her to my apartment. The building where I live has its own garage, so I managed to transport her from the garage to my apartment without anyone noticing through the stairs. It was the middle of the night. In the university, I was, among other related disciplines, a teacher of legal medicine. So I knew how to dissect and embalm a body properly, which is what I did within the next few days. I removed the organs that would rot easily, but I kept the eyes, the skin, the bones, and the hair. Treating them with the appropriate substances, I did a good job. She really looked alive, a lot more than she was before I killed her. I even noticed that the one woman had an ID card with her. Her name was Irina. She is now safe with me in my home, in a secret cold room that I built for her. Safe and in peace. Forever. Alcoholism. That was what started it all. Every Saturday I would roam the streets of town, pouring bottles and bottles down my throat until my liver felt satisfied with pain. I would get a cab back each time, the poor drivers having to deal with my incessant voice, an unbearable harpy-like noise that I look back on with a haze. Whilst the drivers, they certainly remembered. One night in particular, I happened to have gone out again, drinking. Downing wine this time at a local restaurant, bar, with a couple of work colleagues. The succulent aroma of the warm drink felt comfortable on my stomach as I lay down on a nearby sidewalk, about to call a cab to come and collect me from my pitiless state. One after another, every single one I called either turned me down or was busy. I strained my tampered mind and remembered that a new car rental was in the market. My friend Hannah had told me a couple nights before the weekly drinking session. I downloaded the app, loaded it up, clicked a few buttons and signed a few documents until eventually my screen lit up and I was able to bear witness to a man named Tom who was on his way to me now, ready to pick me up and drive me to the safety of my apartment. It told me on the app that he was new, and so had no reviews or ratings or any record of him ever driving with the site before. I was marginally anxious to get in a car with an unknown driver, but I really didn't have a choice if I didn't want to sleep on the concrete sidewalk below me. A matte black Volvo pulled up on the curb about ten minutes into the wait after I had placed my order for a lift. I sat up my head spinning in a vortex of dizzy whirls and gusts of ear-splitting headaches as I crawled over to the side door and clambered inside. 
Is this my Uber? My Uber? I spluttered out in chunks of words that formed distorted sentences. But the information was enough to communicate to the driver that I thought I was getting in. The driver said nothing. He almost looked surprised as I got in strapped up. It was odd, but nothing completely out of the ordinary, as I was on a different plane of drunkenness that the man almost seemed delighted by. This incredibly shocked me. Usually, no late-night taxi driver would ever take pleasure in a drunk person entering their car. Once I had closed the door and told him my address, the car started rolling forward and we were on our way to what should have been my apartment. We drove in silence for quite some time. I remember vividly seeing the outlines of trees flashing me on both sides. I didn't live very near the countryside, so going down a country lane seemed strange. But I really couldn't care, as the alcohol was deep in my system by this point, and I was far more focused on rejecting the urge to vomit everywhere than I was the route this guy was taking me home to. Hi, um, are we nearby? I'm sorry, I'm just really, really tired, and it would be great to get home at some point tonight. I sounded snarky in my speech, but sleep deprivation does that, and mixed with my deteriorating alcohol consumption, I was nearing the end of my patience, as I knew for sure it would not take me 30 minutes to get from town to the apartment. I lived five minutes away. Hmm. He seemed to grumble at my question of when we were arriving home. And so I began thinking maybe I should try tipping him or something for him to take me the right way. I got out my phone to use Apple Pay. But then, all of a sudden, I noticed several missed calls with the app notification above each one. I unlocked my phone and my eyes were engulfed with a waking terror. The notifications came from the cab driver who actually had come to pick me up, asking me where I was, and that he was in a blue BMW a couple minutes walk down the road from the restaurant I'd been at. I slowly looked up, and my eyes met with the crazed look of this blue-eyed man, covered in wrinkles, and a horrific grin spread from cheek to cheek across his face. He glared at me, and finally spoke. You dare call anyone, and I'll kill us both, you whore. This violent outburst made me whimper as I sat back in my seat and tried banging on the door to get it to open, or rather to attract the attention of someone outside. It was a feeble attempt for salvation. We were deep down some random country lane. There were likely to be zero cars for miles, and that was even if he was taking me anywhere with actual people. My breathing picked up as my lungs contracted out of fear for my life as we seemed to speed up down the lane. You, you're mine. Let's go have some fun, shall we? His hand beckoned to the knife it held in front of me. He dangled it directly in front of me, cackling at what evil thoughts he must have had planned. But soon enough, a faint tinge of blue beamed out across the road, and from behind it, a police car emerged from the darkness. The moment I saw the car, its sirens started blasting out all across the woods, and we swiftly pulled over as the man scrambled to hide the knife under his seat as two officers darted towards us, both wielding tasers. They got him out of the car in a matter of seconds, cuffing him shortly after, jamming him in the back of the patrol car as they then turned their attention to me. Hi there, miss. Are you okay? The indescribable feeling of salvation struck me like a bag of bricks, crushing my fears and unleashing the waterfall of tears behind my eyes like a pair of dams being blown wide open. I told them everything that happened that night. The stranger, the alcohol, the fear. And soon enough, my attention turned to the knife hiding under the seat. I pointed to it. They then told me the backstory as to how they knew where to find me before setting me up with an actual lift home. This cab hailing app supposedly had tracking capabilities which allowed the driver to seek their passenger. Tom, my actual driver, had noticed I was heading in the completely wrong direction to the destination I had input. He quickly alerted the police and they pursued after us hotly. As for the man, 
he had decided that he was going to try to take a drunken girl somewhere deep into the forest. But his plans were never told to me past that. All I knew was that if it wasn't for Tom, I could have been killed. Since then, I've tried to remain sober on such occasions in order to keep my guard up, but that man's putrid smile still haunts me. I sometimes see it in the mirror of my own car, watching me with dark purpose, waiting. I clutched my popcorn in one hand and my large smoothie in another as I made my way into the movie theater. I had been waiting for this movie to come out for a long time now. I didn't care that I had no one to watch with. Most people here came in pairs or in groups. Well, except for me. I recently moved into my new dorm at college where I was studying engineering. My parents promised to check up on me once in a while. I was the last child and I knew that they missed me terribly. My older sister is married now and lives in New Orleans. I hadn't made any friends in school yet and I doubted that it would change soon. I sat in the middle row which in my opinion was the best place to sit. I wouldn't have to crane my head to see the screen and I wouldn't be distracted by a lot of people in front of me. I munched on my popcorn as I patiently waited for the movie to start. Halfway into the movie, I noticed something strange about the couple sitting in front of me. The girl was leaning away from the guy but was trying not to be too obvious about it. At that moment, the guy put his arm around her shoulders and I watched her cringe. The guy noticed it too and dug his fingernails into her bare shoulder. I decided to look away since it was none of my business and tried to concentrate on the movie. I didn't want to miss out on anything. When the movie was over, I sighed in bliss and waited for the credits to start rolling. I always watched movies right to the very end and it was only appropriate that I honored this movie by doing the same thing. Everyone else left me in the theater, including the couple in front of me. A part of me wanted to go and help the girl, but I didn't want to get into any trouble. My mom once said I would one day stick my nose in someone else's business and it wouldn't end well for me. I glanced at my wristwatch and saw that it was a little after 8. There were not a lot of people in the theater anymore and it was mostly just the workers. I passed by the ticket stand and something caught my eye. The door behind it was slightly open and I could have sworn that I just heard someone scream. I frowned, wondering why there was nobody at the ticket stand. I tiptoed to the door and peeked inside. I decided to walk in and make sure everything was all right. I walked further in and heard footsteps coming towards me. It sounded like someone was running. The girl that sat in front of me with her boyfriend ran towards me. I couldn't give her a warning before she crashed into me. She had been looking backwards. We both fell to the floor, her scream piercing through my ears. I held her upper arms and asked her what was wrong. Her mascara was smudged and there were tear tracks in her face. Her lips were trembling as she stuttered. C -c call the police! He, he killed him! My confusion grew and I watched as she jumped back to her feet and ran out. I ran after her, not wanting to find out whatever made her that scared. I dug my phone out so I could call the cops. I saw the girl at the elevator doors pressing buttons frantically. The doors refused to open. Before I could ask her to calm down, there was a voice behind me. Why are you running from me? I saved you! I swiveled to see one of the workers staring at the girl. He walked past me to where the girl was. She was sobbing with her hands over her mouth. I got furious. Even though I didn't know the whole story, it was obvious she didn't want to be with him. I held her phone up, my thumb poised over the call button. Leave her alone or I'll call the cops, I yelled. The guy turned towards me and was upon me so fast that I didn't have a chance to react. My phone got knocked out of my hands and I crashed to the floor. She was with a monster and I got rid of him, he yelled and stepped on my hand. I screamed in pain and begged him to stop. 
He did and immediately went back to where the girl was sobbing on the floor. He patted her back and she shuffled away from him, fear evident in her eyes. I grabbed one of the vases used to decorate the place and smashed it on his head. He stumbled and almost fell on the girl, but she moved away quickly. He grabbed my hand, but I noticed that his grip was weak. I screamed as I pushed him away. I grabbed the girl's hand and dragged her to the stairs. We started descending really fast, practically flying down the stairs. He wasn't far behind us, but I knew that once we reached where people were, we would be safe. As we burst into the ground floor, two cops barged into the room with their guns drawn. We ran to the cops and fell over our words as we tried to explain what was going on. They took action fast and went upstairs. They later came back down, saying that he had somehow escaped, but they would do their best to find him. They also asked if we knew anything about the dead body that was in one of the rooms upstairs. The girl broke down in tears and explained that the worker had killed him, saying that men should learn to respect ladies. Olivia, the girl said, sniffing. My name is Olivia. We were huddled at the back of an ambulance van wrapped in blankets. Apparently, one of the workers downstairs was the one who called the cops after hearing strange screams from the floor above. Tess, I replied, shivering a little. The events of the night still felt a bit surreal to me. I went from going to watch a movie to almost getting myself killed. Olivia and I talked for a while and it was probably because we were both still shaken up by what happened. The cops questioned us and ensured we were all right before offering to drop us off at our homes. Olivia and I stayed in contact after that and I found out that her dead boyfriend used to abuse her a lot. They had been together for a couple of months and she showed me bruises from when he had hit her. In a way, I was glad that he was no longer in her life even if it meant that he died horribly. She told me that the worker told him that he wanted to show him something cool and took him into a room where he proceeded to strangle her boyfriend. It was obvious she was still traumatized by everything and I promised to be there for her, glad I had made a friend.